Before we get started, Serial Killers is sponsored by the audiobook edition of After Anna by best-selling author Lisa Scottolini. Publishers Weekly calls After Anna a nail-biting domestic thriller. And you won't want to press pause until the last shocking moment. Start listening at macmillanaudio.com slash after Anna. That's M-A-C-M-I-L-L-A-N audio dot com slash A-F-T-E-R-A-N-N-A. Due to the graphic nature of this killer's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of murder and assault that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. Our story today begins and ends in the city of Santa Rita do Sapucai, Brazil. It's here that one of the most prolific yet under-recognized serial killers of all time currently resides. His name is Pedro Rodriguez Filo, and over the course of his life, he's been convicted of 71 murders. Nearly all of his victims were criminals. But the police were not aware of Filo's penchant for killing criminals when they initially arrested him for murder in 1973. They put him in a squad car with another perp. When police came back to the car, only one of the two men was alive. Hi, I'm Greg Polson, and this is Serial Killers, a podcast that dives into the minds and motives of some of the most infamous and notorious murderers. Today, we're discussing Pedro Rodriguez Filo. I'm here with my co-host, Vanessa Richardson. Hi, everyone. We'd like to ask a quick favor. Would you leave a five-star review of Serial Killers on your favorite podcast directory? It seems so simple, but it really helps us out. And don't forget to subscribe while you're there, because a new episode comes out every Monday. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram, at Parcast, and on Twitter, at Parcast Network. Pedro Rodriguez Filo, nicknamed Padrino Matador, or Killer Petey, murdered 71 victims from 1968 to 2003 in Santa Rita, Brazil. He killed at least 47 of his victims during his three decades in prison. After his release in 2007, Fila was arrested just four years later in 2011 for crimes committed while in prison. He was released for the final time in 2016, and he now lives a quiet life in Brazil. By killing his fellow inmates, Filo cultivated a reputation as a sort of South American Dexter. He was a serial killer who operated by a code, only targeting criminals who he believed deserved to die. But as our investigation will show, Filo was not quite the benevolent serial killer some of his supporters portray him to be. We're going to delve deep into the life of Pedro Rodriguez Filo and uncover who he really was. Pedro Rodriguez Filo was born on June 17, 1954, on a farm near Santa Rita, in the southernmost part of the state of Minas Gerais in southeastern Brazil. Filo means junior, which makes sense since Pedro Rodriguez's father was also named Pedro Rodriguez. For the sake of clarity, we'll refer to our primary subject as Filo and his father as Rodriguez Sr. Filo was the oldest of 14 siblings. His abusive father beat Filo's mother so badly during her pregnancy that Filo was born with a fractured skull. He had a slight indent near his hairline for his entire life. Before Vanessa digs into the psychology, we want to give a brief disclaimer. Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she has done a lot of research for this show. One pattern psychologists have found in serial killers is a history of domestic violence or intimate partner violence, better known as IPV. While we don't have much information on Philo's childhood, including his mother's name, We do know that Rodriguez Sr. was a domestic abuser who regularly assaulted his wife and children. According to health and social service providers in Canada, witnessing family violence has long-term effects on young children, including infants. Occasionally, some young children who witness violence can sometimes exhibit violent behavior themselves. 
I want to stress that the vast majority of victims of IPV, or early traumatic experiences, don't grow up to be violent. But Philo's upbringing is similar to American serial killers studied by the FBI's Behavioral Sciences Unit. The BSU found 50% of violent criminal offenders had parents with criminal pasts. 42% reported childhood abuse from a parent, while 74% reported psychological abuse. These numbers aren't predictive, but they illustrate some similarities that Philo's early life had with the early lives of the participants in these FBI surveys. Although Philo never explicitly blamed his own crimes on his father, his father's abuse clearly created an unhealthy and unstable environment. Philo's first self-reported incident of violence occurred around 1967, when Philo was 13. According to his own account, he got into a physical fight with an older cousin. It escalated when Philo pushed the boy into a cane press. For those unfamiliar, a cane press is used to extract juice for sugar cane by having the cane stick put under high pressure between heavy iron rollers. In rural areas, the heavy rollers are on vertical axles and may be powered with a horse or donkey attached to a harness walking around the structure. The rollers then squeeze the sugar cane, not unlike wringing a towel. Accounts differ on what actually happened to Philo's cousin. In our research, some sources say he was unharmed. In an interview years later, Philo said the cousin's arm got stuck between the wheels. All we know for sure is that the older boy wasn't killed, but this incident certainly showed Philo's budding propensity for violence. After injuring his cousin, 13-year-old Philo realized he longed to kill someone. He considered the cane press incident his first attempted murder. In the same FBI study on violent offenders mentioned earlier, 59% of the respondents reported that the first trigger for their violence was a conflict with a woman. This actually puts Philo in the minority. He never reported any issues with his mother or sisters. He never complained that he was rejected by a love interest. In fact, there's no evidence that any of his motivations or crimes were sexual in nature. The FBI survey also names other common stressors for violent criminals, such as financial problems, unemployment, marital problems, legal problems, physical injuries, the death of a significant person, or the birth of a child. Yet, incredibly, none of these correspond to Philo. Philo is a unique serial killer in many ways, but there's not been the same level of scholarship or research done on him as more famous serial killers. This means our knowledge of his life is limited. We do know that Philo stopped going to school shortly after his fight with his cousin when he was 13. There's no indication that Philo was a particularly good or bad student. There are no reports of school fights or bullying. Philo continued to live at home after dropping out of school, so we can only assume he meant to work or otherwise help support his family. In 1968, when Philo was 14, his father was working as a security guard at a school in a small town of Alfinas, Brazil. That year, Rodriguez Sr. was accused of stealing food from the cafeteria. He was fired by the vice mayor of the town, who oversaw the school. Philo's father maintained that he was innocent. Philo became outraged at this perceived injustice. He somehow got his hands on a shotgun and fatally shot the vice mayor, Minas Gerais. In 1968, at the age of 14, Philo committed his first murder. Dr. Elisa P. Benedict, the Director of Research and Training at the Center for Forensic Psychiatry, cautions that there's no one type of youthful killer. But she's also pointed out that murderous children often come from families where they saw or experienced violence. This was certainly the case for Philo. After the shooting in 1968, nothing happened. Neither Philo nor his father were arrested. It appears the police were not able to solve the case. It's most likely that Philo acted alone and his family was not involved. Philo went back to living at home as if nothing happened. About a month after the shooting, Philo decided to hunt down the man who he believed actually did steal food from the school cafeteria. Armed with that same shotgun, Philo killed the school security guard who he believed was the actual thief. 
after the second shooting, Philo fled from his hometown. The two murders were left unsolved for years. We don't know why Philo left, and we don't know who he stayed with. All we know is his destination, Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is the 13th largest city in the world. As early as 1960, the city had almost 5 million people and was easily the largest city in Brazil. In 1968, Filo, who was on the run for two murders, found refuge in a municipality called Moji das Cruzes. Once he was settled in, he took up a dangerous new enterprise. Still just a teenager, Filo began breaking into homes and stealing whatever could be sold or traded. At some point, he began targeting the homes of men he suspected of being drug dealers. Why them? Well, there's a bit of a risk assessment. Philo probably figured the police would be less likely to get involved if he targeted suspected drug dealers. Since the victims were criminals themselves, they were less likely to contact the police in the first place. Philo's burglaries escalated when one attempted robbery turned into a murder. Philo allegedly killed a drug dealer while burglarizing his home. We don't have much information on this particular incident or many of the other murders committed by Philo. Unfortunately, a lot of Philo's victims get lumped in together, rarely getting concrete identities, stories, or even names. But not all of Philo's life was theft and murder. Around 1970, 16-year-old Philo met a young woman named Maria Aparecida Olympia. They dated and moved in together with plans to get married. But the wedding never took place. One night, Maria and Philo were assaulted by a gang. The two were separated in the attack. Philo got away, but the gang members cornered and killed Maria. Instead of going to the police, Philo vowed revenge. Vigilantes like Philo often claim personal victimhood or justify their actions as carrying out the wishes of the community. Peg Streep, a research-based science writer for Psychology Today, wrote, quote, Killing is often justified by murderers as necessary revenge, along with other heinous acts. End quote. In other words, Philo saw his next murders as revenge for Maria's death. Let's take a break to talk about one of my favorite sponsors, Blue Apron. Did you know Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country? I did. And they're on a mission to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. Pick two, three, or four recipes based on what best fits your schedule. And now, for six weeks, from April 16th through May 21st, Blue Apron is teaming with Airbnb to bring you the best home cooking from around the world. Each week, their menu will feature a recipe developed in collaboration with an Airbnb Experiences host, like Cece, a chef from Shanghai who makes incredible Kung Pao chicken. The other day while I was driving, I realized I had no food at home to cook dinner. Luckily, my Blue Apron delivery was waiting for me when I got home, and I got to eat white cheddar cheeseburgers. So check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free at blueapron.com slash killers. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. One way to put your Blue Apron meal to good use is to cook for someone you love. And if you're looking for love, you can find it through eHarmony. E-Harmony isn't like those other online dating sites. My sister found love on E-Harmony five years ago, and she's never been happier. Plus, our producer signed up to E-Harmony last month and has finally found a stable relationship. No joke. E-Harmony uses years and years of science and data to help you find lasting, meaningful relationships. And right now, our listeners can get a free month with eHarmony when they sign up for a three-month subscription. Just enter the code SERIALKILLERS at checkout. Stop waiting and start your journey to a satisfying, meaningful relationship. It could be fun to play around with online dating apps, but when you're ready to fall in love with someone and have a meaningful relationship, there's one app that's built to bring you real love. eHarmony. Come see how eHarmony can change your life. Go to eHarmony.com and get started. Enter the code SERIALKILLERS at checkout. And now, back to the story. In 1971, 
17-year-old Pedro Rodriguez Filo tracked down the gang members who allegedly murdered his girlfriend Maria. We don't know how many people Filo assaulted or what methods he used to identify the gang members as the ones who had killed Maria the year before. But what we do know is that Filo started to gain supporters who felt he was justified in his quest for vengeance. And together, they learned that the man who killed Maria, or at least the man Filo believed had killed her, was organizing a wedding of his own. Filo and four supporters attacked the wedding party in a devastating mass shooting. They shot 23 people, slaughtering seven. Philo killed his intended target, the suspected gang leader, but he also murdered innocent wedding attendees. Somehow, he managed to flee the scene with police none the wiser. But as we've seen from his previous murders, Philo didn't just go after violent criminals. He was also willing to hunt down people who insulted his family's honor. Shortly after the wedding massacre, Philo learned that one of his cousins was pregnant. It would have been a joyous occasion, except the father of the child refused to marry Philo's cousin. In response, Philo shot and killed the man. Criminologists Ronald Holmes, Stephen Holmes, and James DeBerger categorized serial killers based on their motives. One type they profiled was the missionary killer, who feels compelled to kill a certain type of victim whom they believe is worthy of death. Philo fits this description as he targeted people who he believed had wronged him. Philo's targeting of criminals is also distinctive in that he was targeting dangerous men capable of defending themselves. We don't have his exact physical measurements, but we can tell from looking at his pictures that he's not a big guy. Furthermore, the Padrino or PT nickname also implies a man of smaller stature. This may explain why Philo's early method of killing was shooting his victims. Despite his small size, he could act quickly and effectively with a gun. And since missionary killers only care about killing their victims rather than torturing them, a gun is an appealing weapon for this type of murderer. Philo's singular focus on criminals could have played a role in why the public was more forgiving of him than other serial killers. It may have also helped that he didn't mutilate his victims' bodies or engage in post-mortem rituals except for one time. By 1972, 18-year-old Pedro Rodriguez Filo had a body count of at least 10 people. But it turned out that he wasn't the only man in his family capable of murder. In 1972, Filo's abusive father, Rodriguez Sr., stabbed his wife 21 times, killing her. Rodriguez Sr. then dismembered her corpse with a machete. Thankfully, he was caught and arrested. Natalia Otero, the executive director of DC Safe, has said that one of the oldest myths about domestic violence is the idea that the abuser snaps or is out of control. In her opinion, violence for an abuser is not a random act. It's a way of controlling a situation. As we've discussed, Rodriguez Sr. had a history of violence. He had been abusing Philo's mother for over 18 years. This murder did not come out of nowhere. We aren't aware of Rodriguez Sr. ever stating a motive for the murder, but according to the DART Center, intimate partner violence is about power and control. Abusers are most likely to kill when a woman tries to leave and free herself from her partner's abuse. Abusers perceive the murder as a way of regaining control over their victim. Perhaps this was the case with the Rodriguez. 18-year-old Philo soon found out that his father had murdered his mother. Philo was a killer often motivated by a desire for personal vengeance. His abusive father was an obvious target. We don't know which prison Rodriguez Sr. was sent to in 1972 after killing his wife, but Philo was able to track him down. When Philo visited his incarcerated father, it wasn't like how you would picture modern American visitation halls. The prisons were incredibly overcrowded, understaffed, and underfunded. There was no plexiglass separating prisoners from their visitors, no metal detectors, no guards, no witnesses, no cameras, any one of which might have stopped Philo in his pursuit of revenge. Philo snuck a large knife into the prison. When he was alone with his father, Philo stabbed him repeatedly. 
he killed his father by stabbing him 22 times. He didn't choose this number at random. Philo later said that his father had stabbed his mother 21 times, so he made sure to stab his incarcerated father 22 times. After killing his father, Philo carved out the man's heart and took a bite. He chewed for a few moments before spitting it out. He tossed aside the heart and left the prison. Philo avenged his father's firing. He avenged Maria's death. He avenged his cousin's honor. And now he had avenged his mother's murder. This was the culmination of several new acts for Philo. He had never used a knife as a murder weapon before. He had never killed a man in prison before. He had never engaged in post-mortem theatrics before. And he had never tried cannibalism. We don't know for certain what inspired Philo to use these especially gruesome tactics. Philo later said he did it to make himself feel better. Perhaps he was motivated by anger over the abuse he suffered at his father's hands as a child. Or perhaps he simply wanted revenge for his mother's suffering. Somehow, Philo was able to murder his father and escape the prison without getting caught. Philo stayed in this same region, near Santa Rita and Sao Paulo, until 1973. He cultivated friendships and pursued romantic interests. Philo also kept killing at an alarming pace. He primarily used guns, but developed a preference for knives. Philo continued to target men that he assumed were criminals. Never one to conduct a lengthy investigation of his potential victims, Philo targeted and killed quickly and ruthlessly. Philo later claimed that he never hurt an innocent person, but in the five years between 1968 and 1973, Philo killed at least 24 people. At a minimum, he was likely overconfident in judging the moral character of others. On May 24, 1973, Two police officers arrested Philo for murder. He was now 19 years old. We don't know the details of the specific murder he was arrested for, but it seems unlikely the initial police officers knew who they were dealing with. They handcuffed Philo and put him into the back seat of a police car. But Philo was not alone. Just before picking up Philo, the police officers had arrested a man accused of rape. At some point, the police officers left the vehicle. The two arrested men were alone in the car together. When the police officers returned to the squad car, they discovered that Philo had already killed the other man with his bare hands. This was only a precursor to Philo's next 30 years. Now let's take a quick break from the story to talk about Thapletics. Great leggings are truly a necessity, but they shouldn't cost a fortune. That's why I'm so glad I found Fabletics.com. They make the world's best leggings with performance, quality, and style for two to three times less than other activewear brands. Go to the site and take the style quiz. Fabletics will personalize your shopping experience so your favorite styles rise to the top. Become a VIP to save 40 to 50% off retail prices. 40 to 50%? That's right. I love being a VIP, and our listeners will too. I got two pairs of world's best leggings to wear for yoga class. I love them so much. I wear them everywhere. How can our listeners get in on these great deals? Go to fabletics.com slash serial killers now to get two pairs of their amazing leggings for just $24. Seriously, these are the world's best leggings. They're a $99 value, and you'll get two for only $24 when you join at fabletics.com slash serial killers. That's fabletics.com slash serial killers. And now, back to the story. On May 24, 1973, 19-year-old Pedro Rodriguez Filo was arrested by the police for murder and sentenced to spend the next several decades in prison. Before continuing with Filo's story, we should talk a bit about Brazil's criminal justice system. Brazil has been plagued for decades by unlawful police killings, prison overcrowding, and the torture of detainees. 
According to the reports, a lack of resources in prison makes the prisons dangerous for both guards and inmates. Elizabeth Leeds, an expert on urban violence and former head of the Ford Foundation in Brazil, says that many prisons do not even provide inmates with clothes, toiletries, or mattresses. The undermanned and overcrowded prisons that held Philo over the years frequently had violent fights and riots. The few prison guards available had little control over the prison population. According to an essay in The Economist reviewing American prisons, the number of violent offenders increased through the 1960s and 1970s. Similarly, Brazilian prison populations boomed in the later decades of the 20th century. As a result, prisons in both countries became even more dangerous than before. This was when prisoners started joining gangs for their own protection. But Philo never openly affiliated with gangs. He operated by his own moral code and continued fighting and killing fellow inmates. Prison gave Philo the chance to live among his future 47 victims. By throwing Philo in prison for 30 years in 1973, the police had not trapped a serial killer. They had freed him. Some of Philo's defenders believe that the fact that Philo killed inmates rather than prison guards indicates the inherent worthiness of his actions. But let's be clear here. Philo wasn't just locked up with rapists and murderers. He was with people awaiting trial. Brazilians might wait for years in these prisons, hoping to see a courtroom and go home to their families. Philo didn't care. He killed indiscriminately. One unnamed psychologist who worked with Philo said he killed so frequently that the act of killing stopped having an emotional impact on him. To Philo, it became like smoking a cigarette. It was an addiction, complete with withdrawal symptoms when Philo hadn't killed in a long time. This is similar to other serial killers who go through cooling off periods after they've committed a murder. If Philo struggled with internal demons over these murders while he languished in prison, we don't have evidence of it. What we do know is that he kept killing. All prison authorities did to stop him was transfer him to another prison after he killed 10 people. In our research, it seems little was done to prevent Philo from routinely assaulting and killing fellow inmates. Among his victims, Philo did kill some murderers. This sometimes allowed him to justify his actions as beneficial to the community at large. He could portray himself as a noble vigilante instead of a serial killer who murdered at least 47 inmates. We can see Philo's attempt to manipulate his public persona by examining the relationship between Philo and one of his most notorious contemporaries, Francisco de Assis Pereira, a.k.a. the Park Maniac. In 1998, the infamous Pereira stalked the state park in Sao Paulo, Brazil, looking for young women out alone. He approached women and introduced himself as a talent scout for a well-known modeling agency. After luring the women somewhere private, he raped and murdered them. In 2002, Pereira was sentenced to 274 years in prison for the rape and murder of 11 women. When 48-year-old Philo heard about the park maniac, Philo promised to eventually murder him. He claimed he was demanding revenge on behalf of the murdered victims. But before Philo had a chance to meet the park maniac, other inmates attacked Pereira, leading to a riot. Inmates sometimes orchestrated prison riots as a means of carrying out retribution against individuals or rival gangs. Pereira managed to survive the 2002 riot, but he was soon transferred to a psychiatric facility. Philo never had the chance to kill Pereira. Philo was later asked by an interviewer about his promise to kill the infamous park maniac. Initially, Philo said that he didn't like to talk about, quote, that devil. Yet Philo soon elaborated, explaining that he disliked Pereira because he killed innocent people. Philo then shook his head, lamenting the death of at least 11 women. Philo was portraying himself as a benevolent killer in contrast to the park maniac. Though he did not kill the park maniac, Philo routinely took on the cause of revenge on behalf of others. 
In a 2016 interview, Philo admitted to killing at least 10 inmates as a way of helping or protecting other inmates. He explained that some men couldn't hold a knife or kill for themselves, so he did their killing for them. As he continued to murder other inmates during his years of incarceration, Philo gained quite a few enemies. We don't know the year, but at one point, five inmates teamed up and attacked Philo. In the ensuing melee, Philo killed two of them and severely injured the other three. Philo's face was permanently scarred in the attack. But the inmates had a good reason to be angry at him. Philo didn't just kill the worst of the worst. According to the World Prison Brief, 36% of Brazil's prisoners have yet to be charged with a crime. Even if Philo only targeted people suspected of murder, over a third of his fellow inmates hadn't even been found guilty of anything. And Philo freely admitted he killed inmates for lesser crimes. In one undated case, Philo killed his cellmate because the cellmate snored too frequently and loudly. In another example, Philo fatally stabbed an inmate within seconds of meeting him. When asked why he killed this inmate, Philo claimed that he knew he wouldn't like the other man. In his later interviews, Philo admitted that killing criminals provided him with a thrill. His favorite way to kill inmates was to stab or hack them to death. But this confession brings us to a recurring contradiction in Philo's motivations and self-awareness. Sometimes he admitted that he liked killing. In fact, Philo's right forearm still has a tattoo that reads, Mato por prazer, meaning, I kill for pleasure. Other times, he claimed to regret his murders. In one interview, Philo said he got into crime without thinking. If he knew back then everything that he would eventually go through, he wouldn't have killed those people. In that interview, he made his life of murder sound like an impulsive decision made during his youth. But this is disingenuous at best. After all, he continued killing for decades, even after he was incarcerated. In 2003, 30 years after he was first arrested, 49-year-old Pedro Rodriguez Filo was convicted of murdering 71 people. 47 of those murders took place during his time in prison. But Filo boasted that he actually killed over 100 people. He was sentenced to 128 years in prison. However, this sentence was later increased to 400 years. There was no way Philo would actually live for 400 years, but the sentence of 400 years was meant to demonstrate the severity of his crimes. Unfortunately, in Brazil, there's no such thing as a life sentence. Brazilian law prohibits anyone from spending more than 30 years in prison. Philo was originally set to be released in 2003, but he had four years tagged on as extra judiciary punishment for the murders he committed in prison. So after serving 34 years for his 71 murders, Philo was released in 2007. But his life of crime wasn't over yet. After 34 years in prison, or about six months for every murder victim, 53-year-old Philo was released on April 24, 2007. With scars on his face and tattoos covering most of his body, he fielded questions from reporters. At this press conference, he claimed to feel regret for some of his murders. But he also later confessed that on days he didn't kill, he would feel sick. Philo told reporters that he was putting that part of his life behind him, which may have been a difficult promise to keep given his supposedly physiological need to kill. The public was left to wonder whether Philo really would be able to stop himself from ever killing again. After Philo's release, he worked as a housekeeper on a farm near Balneario Camboriú, a beach resort city in the state of Santa Catarina in southern Brazil. His boss described him as a fun extrovert. His neighbors called him an honest and fun person to be around. But he was still at risk for recidivism. Recidivism refers to the tendency of a convicted criminal to reoffend. A country's recidivism rate is the measurement of how often released prisoners end up back in prison due to subsequent crimes. 
According to a delegation of the European Union sent to Brazil in 2016, the recidivism rate was around 70%. This means 70% of released inmates will be rearrested within five years. The 2016 report cited poor and overcrowded structures, human rights violations, a lack of education, and a lack of training as the primary causes for the high rate of reincarceration in Brazil. And on September 15, 2011, over four years after being released, 57-year-old Philo became one of many former inmates to get re-arrested. But surprisingly, he was not arrested for murder. He was charged with riot and false imprisonment. Both of these alleged crimes stemmed from his previous stint in jail. Yet despite the fact that these were crimes he allegedly committed years earlier, he was still put on trial and sent to prison for them. Philo had garnered so much goodwill with his neighbors that they cried when they found out he had been arrested in the fall of 2011. His employer promised that Philo would have his old job when he got free again. Philo's girlfriend vowed to wait for him on the outside. In 2015, just four years later, 61-year-old Philo was granted additional opportunities to talk to the local media. At one of these interviews, Philo claimed that there are many types of psychopaths. He pointed around to the reporters in the room and insisted that each of them was at least a bit of a psychopath. Now, Philo is not a psychologist, and he's not in a position to diagnose himself or anyone else. This interview may have been a way for him to distance himself from his crimes. He was implying that anyone could be like him, but this isn't possible. Psychologist S.K. Henderson described actual psychopaths as, quote, those individuals who conform to a certain intellectual standard, who throughout their lives have exhibited disorders of conduct of an antisocial or asocial nature, end quote. Henderson also wrote that it's not unusual for psychopaths to have highly developed psychological defense mechanisms, such as rationalization and disassociation. Philo was rationalizing his crimes by claiming anyone could be a psychopath, when he additionally told reporters that he didn't really feel any remorse for his crimes. This was another indicator of his callous nature. A reporter asked Philo whether he had a higher degree of psychopathy than others. Philo agreed that he used to be a psychopath, but then he insisted that he wasn't one anymore. According to researcher Peter Vronsky, the older the psychopath becomes, the more likely that he will become adjusted to living within society's rules. He speculates that this is why some serial killers vanish without being captured or identified. In 2016, Philo was released from prison again. When he was asked if he had any plans for the future, the 62-year-old simply said, quote, to die in peace of old age, without any police around to bother me, without any enemies bothering me, just to live in peace until my time comes, end quote. As far as we know, Philo has been true to his word. The convicted killer of 71 people is now a simple housekeeper living a quiet life in southern Brazil. Thanks again for tuning in to Serial Killers. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Serial Killers, you can find them on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. Or on our website, parcast.com. Spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review or tell us what you think on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram as at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. It seems simple, but it really helps our show. A new episode comes out next Monday. Have a killer week. Serial Killers was created by Max Cutler, is a production of Cutler Media, and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Carrie Murphy, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro and Paul Mahler. Additional production assistance by Carly Madden and Maggie Admire. Serial Killers is written by Nick Adams and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. Don't forget to check out Parcast's latest hit podcast, Gone. 
Gon features our good friends Molly from Conspiracy Theories and Richard from Unexplained Mysteries. Every other Monday, they examine historic disappearances and the theories they've spawned. From the Amber Room to Oliver Cromwell's head, each disappearance is shrouded in mystery, with twists and turns that will leave you desperate for answers. Visit Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts, and search for Gone. That's G-O-N-E. Or visit parcast.com slash gone to listen. That's parcast, P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com slash gone.